Welcome to this, the latest chapter of my own personal journal of the plague year, an economic journal. True, but a pretty sad tale all the same. I'm Andrew Hilton, and I'm the director of the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation, which at 26 years old and counting was on its way to becoming a city institution when it was hit by the coronavirus truck. It's now virtual, though I still have hopes that one day we may be able to resume what I still think of as normal life. In the meantime, no change. In their laudable efforts to flatten the curve, our leaders and the experts who advise them have so far succeeded in flattening the global economy without providing any obvious escape route from the virus itself. After all, even if, like New Zealand, you batten down the population to such an extent that you only have 19 deaths, that doesn't mean that you can reopen for business with impunity. Indeed, uh, with testing suggesting that only 2% of the New Zealand population has COVID antibodies, it is possible to argue that New Zealand is more vulnerable than countries like Sweden or even the UK or cities like New York, where infection rates may be 15 or 20 times higher than that. I still have this terrible feeling that unless Elon Musk or Bill Gates magics up a vaccine, all of us are going to have to get the damn disease before we can return to any sort of normality. And as I've said before, in the meantime, non-COVID deaths are increasing sharply. Why? Because people don't want to see a doctor. They don't want to go to hospital because hospitals themselves are prioritizing COVID patients. And perhaps simply because being cooped up at home just isn't healthy, physically or mentally. Unfortunately, well, at least in my opinion, unfortunately, the government scare campaign has been so successful that an Ipsos Mori poll for the BBC this week found that a substantial majority of the population, including, sad to say, a large majority of my age group, uh, supports lockdown until the coronavirus is unequivocally beaten, whatever that means. In the meantime, what, one can, what can one say about the economic damage that's being done? Well, at a global level, world trade was down 2.6% year on year in February. That is before the impact of the coronavirus had really hit anywhere other than in East Asia. On top of that, the ILO, the International Labour Organization, warned last week that 1.6 billion informal workers are now in grave danger and that global working hours in the second quarter will be down 10.5 percent which is equivalent to the loss of 305 million full-time jobs. Most of those will be in poor countries with grossly inadequate social safety nets and the inevitable consequence will be yet another surge in South to North mass migration. Great, or not great, for democracy as we know it. So, to the global economy. Well, there are finally a few positives. In South Korea, for instance, GDP actually rose at an annual rate of 5.6% in the first quarter, and China's PMI's April 4, that's the Purchasing Managers Indices for April, reinforced the feeling that the country that plunged the world into this crisis is the one that will emerge from it first, and that it may actually improve its relative economic position. Though, to be fair, it may also face a backlash from those emerging markets along its Belt and Road Initiative who had borrowed close to $500 billion from Beijing and who are now facing a triple whammy of the coronavirus itself, of shrinking world trade, and of collapsing remittance flows. So far, China has said it may defer debt service on the BRI loans, but it's ruling out any more substantial debt relief. We will see. Elsewhere, the focus last week was, as usual, on the United States. The light relief was the sex scandal involving the septuagenarian Joe Biden, who's being accused of, wait for it, 
unwanted digital penetration of a Senate intern 27 years ago. What adds a, a certain spice to this oh-so-commoner's garden scandal is that when Trump was accused of something rather similar, Biden was in the forefront of those insisting that there should be a presumption that what the brave women who were making these allegations were saying was true. In this case, the mainstream US media is crippled by its hatred of Trump and by its fear that this scandal may paralyze the Democratic Party. However, the Wall Street Journal, which is hardly a supporter of the Democrats, had an interesting take on it this week. It is suggesting that the left wing of the Democratic Party, probably not Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, uh, but AOC and uh, others may well try to use this as an opportunity to ditch Biden in favor of someone younger, someone more progressive, and someone less likely to forget his or her lines. Biden is well aware of this, and it has therefore increased the pressure on him to nominate who is going to be his vice presidential candidate. I still think that Amy Klobuchar uh, would be his best bet, and Stacey Abrams his worst bet, but I note a new name in the frame, Gretchen Widmer, the governor of Michigan, which happens to be a state that the Democrats must win if they're to, keep, if they're to win the presidency. We will see. As for the US economy, there were two big releases last week. The first was first quarter GDP growth, which came in at minus 1.2% quarter on quarter, or 4.8%, minus 4.8% on an annual basis, down from plus 2.1% in the fourth quarter of last year. And the second was the first time jobless claims figures, which came in again at 3.8 million in the latest week, meaning that over 30 million people, or 12.4% of the US workforce, has already signed on for benefits since the coronavirus scare began. On top of that, it was reported last week that personal spending in the US fell at an annual rate of 7.6% in the first quarter, that business investment fell 8.6%, and that the final figure for the ISM, the Institute of Supply Management's manufacturing PMI, fell last month from 49.1 to 41.5, with the new order index falling from 42.2 to 27.1, and the employment sub-index falling from 43.8 to a 70-year low of just 24. 7.5. Enough numbers? No? Well, the Dallas Fed's manufacturing index uh, fell last week from a, an already stunning low of minus 70 because of the damage that has already been done to the oil patch to minus 73.7, while the Richmond Fed's index fell from plus 2 to minus 53. These are terrible, terrible numbers, unthinkable, only a month or so ago. Now, of course, Jared Kushner, that well-known economic laureate in waiting, insisted last week that the US economy will be, and I quote, really rocking by July. But surprise, surprise, most people don't believe him. Indeed, last week, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, predicted that US GDP will fall at least 12% in the second quarter, and some private estimates are a lot worse than that. Elsewhere, at least outside of China and North Korea, it's just a litany of bad news. In the Eurozone, for instance, it was reported last week that GDP fell 3.8% in the first quarter. It was also reported that the services sentiment index for the Eurozone fell from minus 2.3 to minus 35 that the Industrial Confidence Index fell from minus 11.2 to minus 30.4, that the Business Climate Index fell from minus 0.28 to minus 1.81, which is, you know, seven or eight times uh, worse, and that the Economic Sentiment Index fell from 94.2 to 67. 
and things will get worse. At a member state level in the Eurozone, it was also pretty dire. French GDP, for instance, fell 5.8% in the first quarter. Italian GDP fell 4.7%. I think that was an under, underestimate. And Spanish GDP fell 5.2%. Even in Germany, which hasn't yet reported its GDP figures, it was reported that retail sales fell 5.6% in March and that the unemployment rate rose from 5.0 to 5.8% last month, which ignores the 10 million people in Germany who have been put on part-time working or on paid leave. Here in the UK, the CBI's distributive trades index fell last month from minus 3 to minus 55, with a lot more bad news to come. All of those are just numbers, but they shouldn't mask a deeper truth. The economic heart of the West is being ripped out. When we hear that Rolls-Royce is about to lay off 8,000 workers or that 7% of Fannie Mae mortgages in the US are already in arrears, or that Berkshire Hathaway, Berkshire Hathaway has just reported a $50 billion quarterly loss, we really ought to appreciate that the damage being done won't be repaired by lower interest rates or even by another new loan program. Nevertheless, those are the options that are open to us, perhaps the only options, though I know that Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the US House of Representatives, is now open to radical ideas like a universal basic income that would have been anathema a couple of months ago. So, what kind of money did governments and central banks throw at the coronavirus problem last week? Well, in the US, the Fed pledged, and I quote, to use its full range of tools to support the economy. But it didn't actually unveil any new initiatives when the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, met last week, while the Treasury pledged a further expansion of the Paycheck Protection Program, enormously popular, and new aid for local governments. Here in the UK, we had a new bounce back loan program providing a 100% government guarantee on loans to small businesses up to 50,000 pounds to be provided through high street banks, though bizarrely, not through fintechs or community development institutions, which could probably do a quicker job. It's an improvement. And it's, but it's still debt, and there are still questions over banks' liability to carry out the due diligence that the government is insisting be a part of that new loan program. Within the Eurozone, there's been a lot of talk over the last few weeks, but not much action. With the Commission's proposal for a 1 trillion euro recovery fund still stalled. However, the Commission is doing what it can, proposing a significant relaxation of bank capital rules and postponement of the scheduled increase in large bank capital buffers. That really isn't very much, and it's certainly not enough. And the markets are increasingly negative, at least. On Italy, where the 10-year bond spread over German bunds has gone out to well over 200 basis points. However, while government bond markets in Europe may be uh, unimpressed, equity markets around the world have just enjoyed a record month. For April as a whole, the Dow, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, was up 13%. The S&P 500 was up 14%. The tech-heavy Nasdaq was up 17%. Elsewhere, the Nikkei 225 in Japan was up 10%. The Zetrodax in Germany was up 13%. And even our dear FTSE 100 was up 6%. Now, of course, most markets are still down 20 or 30% for the year to date. As somebody with a... Uh, personal pension pot, I'm well aware of that, but that was still a pretty stunning recovery, particularly since there's scarcely a single reputable economist anywhere who anticipated it. I tried to get a private investor friend of mine in Connecticut to explain it to me, and all he said was, it never pays to buck the Fed. Well, I think that sums it up. The Fed 
and the US Treasury have thrown so much money at the coronavirus problem in, in the form of quantitative easing, in the form of bond buying, submarket lending, and so on, much of it either ill-targeted or not targeted at all, that markets are awash with liquidity. And that means that at least some of it is going to find its way into equity markets. But will it last? Or is it just a dead cat bounce? After all, during every major equity collapse going back well before 1929, there have always been days, weeks, sometimes even months when markets bounce back. I hate to say it, but that is what it looks like to me. And I note the very panicky sell-off on Friday, when almost every major Western market was down 2 to 3%. A lot of people, I assume the same people as usual, are, however, going to make a lot of money out of markets that display this kind of volatility. But I fear the same people, amateurs, people like me, and French banks are going to lose a lot too. All of this emphasizes, at least to me, just how important it is to get the global economic machine going again. Here in the UK, I fear that Boris Johnson is still in thrall to his scientific experts, not least after his near-death experience at St Thomas's, and that we are therefore going to be laggards. Plus, there just isn't the same public pressure to reopen the economy here as there is, for instance, in the US, where gun-wielding citizens have been making their opinions heard in the South and in the Midwest. Indeed, it really does appear as though a majority of those in lockdown in the UK are happy to stay that way till kingdom come. Still, we were promised a roadmap this week which may offer some common sense relief, and indeed, I am fairly impressed by the draft that was being circulated last night for comment. It's not too bad. Staggered shifts, no canteens, no hot desking, and continued social distancing are not unreasonable things to ask. However, there does seem to be one big, perhaps insuperable problem, legal liability. Rules like that are bound to be breached as workers become more comfortable with them. And ambulance chasing lawyers are going to have a field day the next time the coronavirus strikes, or indeed any other virus strikes. We will also have more detail this week from both Germany and France on how they will ease and when they will ease, though both Macron and Mrs Merkel appear a little bit more cautious than most of their ministers elsewhere. It was reported last week that poor old Bangladesh is putting its textile workers back to work, that Poland, Italy and Hungary are all reopening parks and restaurants, perhaps only for takeaway, that Switzerland is also reopening its restaurants and its hairdressers, that Israel is reopening beauty salons, I really like that one, uh, and that Texas is not renewing the stay-at-home order that expired last Thursday. On the other hand, New York State has extended its lockdown through, though the situation in the US is extraordinarily fragmented. The other big victim of this coronavirus is the global oil market. I think we all understand now what happened at the beginning of last month when the settlement price of front month contract, the, the front month contract for Whitty West Texas Intermediate went to minus $42. It's currently just under $20, which is positive, and the market is in modest contango, which is normal and, the, and healthy. But don't be fooled. It could all blow up again. The IEA's annual report, for instance, published last week, predicts that global energy consumption, that is all forms of energy, could fall 6% this year, with US demand down 9% and EU demand down 11%. The impact of this on the oil market will be devastating. According to the IEA itself, total demand for oil was down 29 million barrels a day in April, while production was down just 9.3 million barrels a day. As I already pointed out, the recent OPEC Plus agreement was only intended to take somewhere around 9.7 or 10 million barrels a day out of the market, and it only kicked in, if indeed it kicked in at all, last Friday. Moreover, 
We've already heard from Russian producers, uh, Lukoil and Rosneft, just how difficult it's going to be to switch Siberian production on and off. And I still don't really believe that Nigeria, Angola, Libya, Iraq, Iran, Venezuela are constrained by anything other than the amount that they can actually pump and sell. For them, the deal is really something that is pretty near meaningless. I note stories over the weekend that charter rates for tankers, LR1 and LR2 and VLCC tankers, have actually eased over the last few days, which may suggest that the squeeze on storage base is also easing. Perhaps, as some reports have suggested, new storage in abandoned salt mines and places like that has been found for the oil, but don't rule out another crisis at the end of this month. It could well happen. I just want to end by speculating a bit on what the world will look like when or if we ever get out from under the coronavirus plague. I would suggest first that it will be a just-in-case world rather than a just-in-time world that we have come to love and know. Over the last 20 to 25 years, just about every possible ounce of fat has been stripped from the system, making it incredibly efficient, incredibly profitable, at least with the private equity firms, hedges, and the vulture funds who prompted that stripping, but extraordinarily fragile and vulnerable to the kind of exogenous shock that we have just experienced. Wall Street will fight it, but I have to assume that once bitten twice shy, that governments will step in to ensure much greater resilience and redundancy, even at the risk of greater inefficiency. Second, I have to believe that for better or worse, a corollary of that will be a retreat from globalization. It won't be a return to autarky or to full-fledged economic nationalism, but reshoring, onshoring, bringing jobs home will all be important political drivers going forward, no matter who's in the White House or who's in Downing Street. Third, I think the inevitable implication of all of this is a much, much bigger role for government. As thousands of smaller private sector companies fold, and as others find they cannot service the debt that they've taken on, the public sector will find itself a much more active player and an equity owner of everything from airlines to department stores. The implication of this is that, in my view, it's a sad one. The most dynamic sector of the British economy over the last 10, 15, 20 years has been small scale tech based startups. I very much hope that they can use their inherent flexibility to survive and indeed to thrive. But I fear that the next generation is going to look at the post-COVID carnage and is going to say, how do I apply to get into the civil service? Not, I think, a recipe for long-term economic success. Thank you for listening.